So yeah, so those are really very yeah, and again, do you have a Yes. Okay. Uh, so you're available most of the week. Exactly. Don't be shy. Right. Um, you know what? It's a small member. Probably the best. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. This is this not the chair that we have in the moment. Uh, um, uh, okay. So, as Welcome to the C.W. Williams Community Health Center, Incorporated. Troubled by the ever-present inequity in health care and name. Well, Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Yes, ma'am. When you're done, I was hoping to run into you because my computer got a different way. Okay. It's probably because I never know the things or something. I don't know. Is it upstairs? No, it's here in my bag. Okay. okay. I, I'm not good on these PC types. I have a Mac. I understand. So I don't. I 
Yeah. I see you in that damn glass. So. Yeah. That's a signal here. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, but, but I'm just saying, I'm just being out. Okay. So, she wants to stay for a minute. She said she'd be back. What you doing? Put this at the bottom. Put this at the bottom. Yes. Are they going to need it? No, we're sharing. I can't get rid of it, but I can at least put it. I can put it at the bottom at least. He's bringing the rolling ones in.
I had to go in here. Look at that brown. Look at that brown stuff over there. Yeah. Huh? Okay. We're good. We'll just use the keyboard for If I have a meeting, I'll just bring one down. I have a spare. Appreciate it, man. Uh, good evening. Uh, you know, I like to start on time. I'm three minutes late. Uh, but good evening. My name is Arthur Griffin, and welcome to the Mecklenburg County Health and Human Services Committee of the Board. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome the public, and we have two of our committee members and one guest, so we can't take any any action per se, but we certainly can follow the agenda and uh, hear from the phenomenal presenters that we have uh, in front of us. Uh, to date, we've completed our income maintenance uh, presentations, and now we're on the health side in terms of some of the uh, federally qualified health centers uh, in terms of the delivery of health services to residents that are insured and uninsured. And this should be uh, a very informative session this afternoon. I'd start off by uh, asking uh, my colleague to introduce herself. And we also have a guest commissioner. We'll have her introduce herself. Good afternoon. I am Laura Meyer and I represent District 5. Commissioner Rodriguez McDowell. Thank you. I'm uh, Commissioner Rodriguez McDowell, elected by the people of District 6. And I'm Arthur Griffin, and I represent you as your county commissioner at large. Uh, commissioner Powell uh, will be excused uh, this afternoon, and we're still waiting on Commissioner Lee to, to join us. Uh, I'd also like to have the executive staff and guests introduce themselves. So I'll start with our deputy county manager, uh, good afternoon, Anthony Trotman, Deputy County Manager, Consolidated Health and Human Services Agency Director. 
Good afternoon, my name is Ronnie Devine. I'm the Deputy Director for Community Support Services. Good afternoon, Kim Henderson, Director of Child, Family and Adult Services. Good afternoon, everybody. Raynard Washington, Public Health Director. Good afternoon, Taya Cruz, Assistant to Deputy County Manager. Afternoon, everybody. Robert Nesbitt, Chief of Staff for Health and Human Services. Good afternoon, Yolanda Griffin, Director for Department of Community Resources. Were there guests over there that's not going to make presentations? Okay. So if you all, and we can give them a mic. Um, okay. Well, you can start with. I'm Malcolm Davis with C.W. Williams. Adana Holiday with C.W. Williams Community Health Center. Deborah Week, Deborah Weeks, C.W. Williams Community Health Center. Yeah, I'm making a presentation. Thank you. I'm Robin Codrington. I'm the Director of Crisis Response Services. Hi, I'm Abby Wyatt, the Livable Vet Coordinator with Mecklenburg County. I'm Ben Chambers, a Business Manager with the Public Health Department. said our topics this afternoon uh, are related to federally qualified health centers and I call on our deputy county manager to introduce this topic and also the presenters. What I would ask uh, Commissioner Meyer and the Minister Dow is just to jot down your questions um, and at the end of all three of the presentations uh, then we'll start to ask them for questions. Uh, again, good afternoon, commissioners. We are fortunate to have three um, community health centers uh, present in our county, which um, we all we have contractual relationships with all three um, organizations. And the first uh, presenter will be C.W. Williams, followed by Charter Community Health, and then the Cabarrus Rural and Community Health Clinic, which is our newest um, community health center. So, this week's? No. I should have worn my big girl shoes today. <clears throat> Good afternoon um, to you all. Um, we are grateful for the opportunity to speak today. As I said, I'm Dr. Adana Holliday. I'm the Chief Compliance Officer at C.W. Williams Community Health Center. I'm joined, of course, by my wonderful CEO, Ms. Deborah Weeks. And we also have Mr. Malcolm Davis. He is our HIV and AIDS Prevention and Treatment Specialist Director. Okay. So a little about our organization. Um, later on in our presentation, we have a brief video that will talk about our history and why we are here. Um, but C.W. Williams Community Health Center is the oldest FQHC in the Charlotte area. Um, we cover a number of services and a number of areas, including Mecklenburg County, as well as the surrounding counties. Um, we've served for 42 years. We provide 
a number of services, again, spanning medical, dental, behavioral health. We'll go into all of our additional services a little bit later. And then we provide comprehensive, um, restorative, and emergent services as well. Okay. Some of our services that are supported by our federal dollars are affordable medical and dental, affordable pharmacy prescriptions, HIV medical and case management services, maternal and child health, as well as one of our newer services, remote patient monitoring. Remote patient monitoring allows us to track and provide care to our chronic disease state patients, even while they're not with us. So um, those visits, you know, that time, that three month, six month time period between medical visits, we can actually check in on those patients in the interim, provide them with refills and emergent care through um, devices that actually will send Bluetooth signals back to the center and give us all of their readings. And we do this for both blood pressure, diabetes readings, as well as weight management. The services that are so graciously supported by Mecklenburg County itself um, include our homeless and uninsured care. So as you know, we have a rising amount of homeless in our county, specifically in our city. Um, CW1 Community Health Center takes care of those patients in a number of ways, including our mobile health um, units. We also go to the shelters, provide care there, as well as patients are brought to our centers for care. We provide mental health and substance use in both group visits, one-on-one -on -one visits. We have MAT or medication assisted treatment services as well as therapy services. We also had the opportunity to provide a health literacy program specifically for COVID um, because of the county. And so we we're so grateful. That was a wonderful opportunity to get the information and the knowledge out regarding COVID testing, COVID vaccines, and what COVID was doing to our community. We have our HIV primary care and case management services. Um, Mr. Davis, of course, directs that department, but we've had the privilege to provide HIV care in this community for a long time. Our numbers are 20 years. Thank you, Ms. Weeks. And our numbers are increasing on not only HIV diagnosis, but STI diagnosis, specifically syphilis. So we provide medical care, case management, ancillary services, transportation, peer support, um, as much care as we can to all of those patients, including testing. That testing goes not only in-house, but also into the community at point of care. And then finally, we provide a emergency financial assistance for those living with HIV. We're able to do this through our EHE program. And so um, we strive to make sure that we are decreasing barriers to care. So if a barrier to a person achieving their health outcomes is that they are unable to pay for a light bill or unable to pay rent, then we have limited funds that are able to help that patient um, not worry about those day-to-days and actually focus on becoming better and becoming whole. Not just HIV, emergency financial assistance and copay. And copay assistance as well. Thank you. And then some Charlotte-specific funding that we have received allows us to provide non-emergent patient transportation. So bringing patients to and from their medical visits, we will also offer specialty visits. Um, if one of our providers are sending a patient to a specialty visit, it makes no sense if, for us to send that patient if they cannot actually arrive to the visit. And so our mobile um, buses will actually take our patients to and from, we do, of course, pediatric blood lead testing on site and then substance use counseling and treatment as yeah, well. Also do them from, uh, referrals. Yes. Here is a snapshot of some of the additional services that we offer. Um, this is really just a drop in the bucket compared to what we do every day, but in the midst of us saving lives, and that's what we do as FQHCs, um, we have, of course, behavioral health. We have preventative and restorative dental care. Our holistic medicine line, we'll talk a little bit more about, um, but this specifically provides acupuncture, acupressure, seating, cupping, therapeutic massage um, to our patients that need it. It's a wonderful way, including herbal medicine, it's a wonderful way to decrease pain management or assist with pain management, as well as assist with other chronic disease states. 
We also offer mobile medical and dental services. These units go outside of Charlotte proper to make sure that our patients can receive care. Um, they also go to our nearby shelters as well. We have long acting reversible contraceptive services. This includes um, our IUDs. It also includes Nexplanons that can be implanted. We have Medicaid care management, which we provide on site and remotely to all patients that have been uh, allotted Medicaid services. We have patient education services that range from, of course, remote patient monitoring to diabetes education and beyond. Our active outreach team that provides a number of events throughout the year, including our back to school health fair um, that is in celebration of Health Center Week, National Health Center Week. We also provide vaccines, vision screenings, uh, physicals, sports physicals for children. We do a turkey drive every year. We also have the opportunity to do a toy drive every year. So just a number of our events that we provide and where we give back to the community. And then we have Medicaid, Medicare, and ACA enrollment for those who are uninsured but may be eligible to receive insurance. And thank goodness for Medicaid expansion, we're able to offer that to even more patients at this time. And then finally, we have case management as well as our food pantry on site to provide additional resources as well. So this is some of our recent data. At the time of this report, we used our data from our annual UDS, which was done for the year 2022. We've just collected and submitted all of our data for 2023. And so once that is reviewed, that will be made public as well. Um, so in the 2022 calendar year, we served 13,239 patients, um, over 30,000 encounters, 38% of our patients were uninsured, 61% of our patients are identified as African American, 19 identify as Hispanic, and 11 identify as Caucasian. And that is drastically changing, not only by zip code, but based on the patient services that we offer, as well as the staff that we've employed. I believe this year, our African-American rate was around 61, 62, but our patient population of those identifying as Hispanic was up to about 25 almost. In 2023, just to name a few of the impacts that we've had across the area, uh, we distributed over 250 Narcan um, we educated patients, we went into the areas that are most known for overdose, provided that on the street, at the gas stations, wherever patients gathered or individuals gathered, um, really took the time to make sure that we were giving back to the community and taking the time to educate not only users, but those around users how to properly use Narcan. We did something similar for HIV self-testing kits, and that was led by Mr. Davis and his team. We distributed over a thousand self-testing kits across the county, including the shelters, as well as um, outside of institutions. We visited 12 pre-K programs um, and provided them with dental screening. So we saw over 150 pediatric children, um, specifically screening them for dental. And a lot of times we were the first dentist that a child had ever seen. And then 2,737 pharmacy prescriptions um, to patients that would not have been able to afford prescriptions without our 340B program. And then over 40 newly diagnosed HIV patients which is astounding uh, because those numbers historically have been very low, especially in our county, even though we know that the rate of HIV is increasing. So 40 new diagnoses in one year was a large number. We have a brief, yes, and I'm gonna have Ms. Week speak right before we do our video. Two things um, that Dr. Holliday did not mention. Good afternoon, Bill Malik. I Local commissioner, we are happy to see you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Again, I did not, uh, we did not mention the maternal health program that we are funded now for, and we will be actively going out into various supportive, uh, various communities to provide support, not only within Mecklenburg, but also surrounding counties where we are seeing a high increase in maternal death, uh, early child death. Uh, infant mortality, just increasing phenomenally. So we are in fact doing three different parts to it. We are doing the community-based program, 
with hubs, our local partners. We're doing medical, of course, and mobile medical, of course. Did I leave something out? Uh, training. Training. Hmm? Training. Oh, and I'll train a CHW training program for maternal health specifically. So in fact, uh, they will be able to directly care for the patients as a support team to the medical doctors, as well as to the community-based organization. The other program that I'm proud to talk about is our teaching family residency program. And um, Carolyn, Allison, and I, we started that idea like five years ago minimum, and it's finally finally coming to fruition. Once that is in place, uh, we will talk more with our local FQHCs. And in fact, we'll have, we'll be training up residents and doctors within the FQHC world. Hopefully they'll buy into uh, the model of care and they'll become public health people who will, physicians who will in fact serve. So we're really excited about that. Did I leave anything else? But those are the two big new programs beside our wonderful building, which Dr. Holiday will talk about. Okay. So we're gonna play the video. I know we are, we have a time allotment and then we'll talk a little bit about our new location as well. Welcome to the C.W. Williams Community Health Center Incorporated. Troubled by the ever-present inequity in healthcare in 1981, Dr. C.W. Williams, along with a group of his peers, began the C.W. Williams Community Health Center becoming the first federally qualified health center, or FQHC, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Our mission is to improve spiritual, physical, and psychosocial health by providing access to the highest quality comprehensive health care and ancillary services regardless of an individual's ability to pay. CWWCHC is nestled in the heart of Charlotte, North Carolina. We have numerous locations to meet the needs of Charlotte residents, including our mainstay location at 3333 Wilkinson Boulevard and our additional locations at 5800 Old Pineville Road and 800 Clanton Road. CWWCHC also has a co-located dental clinic at Weber Dentistry. Here at C.W. Williams CHC, we believe in caring for your entire family. We offer adult and pediatric care, maternal and child health services, health screenings, SDI testing, health education, and a number of other medical and ancillary services to meet your needs. Our team cares about your total health. With the rise of sexually transmitted infections in our community, CWWCHC has expanded our HIV and SDI program to include more education, testing, treatment, and supportive services to those in need and those at risk. Our mobile medicine program extends our efforts to provide quality health care by going beyond the boundaries of brick and mortar and reaches patients where they are. We offer both medical and dental services in our state-of-the-art mobile units. Our Check Your Smile Dentistry Clinic offers preventative, restorative, general, and emergency services to keep your smile beautiful. Our in-house pharmacy supplies all of your medication needs including affordable pricing, chronic care management, and medication therapy management. Do you need someone to talk to, struggling with emotional eating, or concerned about substance use? Don't worry, our behavioral health team has you covered with resources to help you be your best self. CWWCHC cares for the whole person and our newest service line of holistic medicine treatments blend with traditional Western medicine to provide acupuncture, pain relief, nutritional support, and offer herbal supplements. For patients needing additional support, we provide services to address social determinants of health including assistance with medical insurance, financial instability, food insecurity, and translation needs. Need a ride? The CWWCHC Non-Emergent Transport Program provides rides to and from appointments and referrals made by our providers. 
Our community matters to us and we support by giving back and providing care to rural, homeless, insured, and underserved patients in Mecklenburg and surrounding counties. We are excited about all of the new developments at C.W. Williams Community Health Center. Currently, our team is furiously preparing for the launch of the long-awaited NC Medicaid expansion. This movement will allow many more patients access to insured medical services. Next, we are excited about all of our new partnerships to allow for research opportunities, internships, new services, and our upcoming family medicine residency program. Lastly, the ever-changing dynamics of healthcare and nonprofit funding have fortified CWWCHC's compliance efforts. This year, CW Williams CHC experienced upwards of 11 audits. We are elated to announce the glowing reviews received from each of the aforementioned visits demonstrating compliance. In particular, our operational site visit from the Health Resources and Services Administration or HRSA received 100% compliance when reviewing the entire organization in the areas of finance, administration, and clinical. Among the entirety of our favorable audits, CWWCHC would like to also highlight our CDC COVID-19 vaccine audit and NC Board of Pharmacy inspection which both received 100% compliance reports as well. Our Ryan White diagnostic site visit provided fantastic reviews and finally, our last completed fiscal audit reported CWWCHC in excellent financial state with no financial or material concerns. This year as every other, highlights the constant focus of our organization on abiding by all federal, state, and local regulations as well as being judicious with all funding. After years in the making, CWWCHC broke ground on our new mainstay location at 3333 Wilkinson Boulevard in July of 2023. Our new location will be ready for operation summer of 2024 and will host modern advancements to fulfill all of your medical needs. We are also expanding our maternal and child health program to provide education, supplies, treatment, and resources to black and brown mothers in our community. Our EMBRACE program will focus on decreasing inequities in maternal health. The C.W. Williams CHC experience is designed to help you live stronger and longer. Our organization provides quality and comprehensive care for every stage of your life so that you can live healthier and experience more. We aim to help you get and stay healthy so you can enjoy every smile, every hug, and every experience. Every day, we are thankful for the difference we make, the patients we touch, and the lives we save. Without you, we would not be here. We stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us and stand to make a lasting impact on our community. Celebrating 42 years of healing hearts, souls, and minds in the Charlotte community. We are the C.W. Williams Community Health Center. Thank you. As you all know, we have our wonderful building that is scheduled to open this summer. If you have not been toward the airport, we invite you to please take a moment, drive down Wilkinson Boulevard where you can see all of our hard work and our state-of-the-art building that will offer more jobs to our community as well as places to expand all of our services. Thank you. Thank you, any questions? Thank you, Dr. Uh, Holliday and uh, Ms. Wilkes. And we will uh, ask questions at the conclusion of the presentations. And the commission is just going to take some notes right now. But thank you very much. Thank you. So our next expert, Zena, will be Charlotte Community Health uh, Center. Um, Ms. Carolyn Allison. Oh, my God. That was awesome. <laughs> I just had to say that. Um, good job, Deborah. And, you know. I'm honestly very happy to see all the wonderful changes happening with C.W. Williams. Welcome, Don. It's nice to have you in the community too. Um, my um, presentation will be relatively short. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Carolyn Allison. I'm the CEO for Charlotte Community Health Clinic. And do I need to, excuse me, press enter? 
Get the left arrow. Awesome. Okay. Just a little bit of history about um, our practice. In 2001, Charlotte Community Health Clinic, we were founded by um, Dr. Ophelia Garmin Brown. Some of you may know her in this community. She was truly a force to be reckoned with. Um, and she opened our practice as a free clinic in 2001. In 2015, um, CCHC, as we refer to it, became a community health center or other people know us, you may know us as a federally qualified health center. And what that means is that we provide, similar to my colleagues, we provide expanded medical behavioral health, homeless health care, and also dental services. We are required as a community health center to offer these core services. So you will hear from all of us. We are currently at three locations um, in East Charlotte, West Charlotte, and also the North Charlotte University area. Um, this year in February, on, on the 6th of February, CCAC, we opened our fourth location. We're really excited about that. It's a pediatric clinic at the Thompson Child and Family Focus Center. Thompson Child and Family Focus is a behavioral health organization. They provide services to on children and the same population that we serve, underserved individuals. By co-locating within their building, we're able to provide immediate access to pediatric care to those individuals coming in for services, but also more importantly, to the community at large. This is just, I'm not gonna go through this list because very similar once again, um, we offer adult medicine, pediatric medicine. We're also involved with the BSEP program for mammography and cervical screenings. Um, also, we what's unique about our health center, um, and it's similar to some other health centers, is that we offer integrated behavioral health. And what is that? We, we provide behavioral health services incorporated within our primary care clinics. And so when a patient comes in to see a primary care provider, if they need any assistance from a behavioral health provider, then that physician or mid-level can go out and ask for that licensed clinical social worker to come in and really work with that individual. So they get immediate access to care. And that is something that we're doing at all of our sites. And we're very, very grateful for that. Also access to specialty care. You're probably familiar with caring, physicians reach out. We've been partnering with them for years. If we did not have access to that resource, many of our uninsured individuals would find it extremely difficult to access specialty care. We too, um, we're very grateful for the Ryan White Part A grant through Mecklenburg County. This is a new grant for us and we're beginning to grow the program. We've been able to bring a physician on board who's part-time, who actually started the Ryan White Clinic at Atrium 20 years ago. And so she's bringing that knowledge with her to really assist us. We also brought on board another, um, a nurse practitioner who's certified in this care so we can begin to grow this program. So we're not as far along as CW, but you know we're learning from you guys. On dental services for families, we are located on the, our dental clinic is located at the Good Opportunity Campus with, on Wilkinson Boulevard. We're the only dental clinic there and also medical clinic at the Good Opportunity Clinic or, or center, I should say. School-based oral health. Uh, we're partnering with both of the hospital systems, with Novant and also with Atrium, in order to access their mobile units so that we can provide school-based oral health to individuals in the community. We have a partnership with Sugar Creek Charter, um, and we've been providing that service to the children at Sugar Creek Charter through K, on, through K through fifth grade, and we're interested in expanding that also over time. Healthcare for the Homeless program, we've been partnering with Roof Above. We place an RN at the men's shelter and also at Urban Ministry two days a week at each site. So our homeless neighbors have immediate access to the services. And the nurse is able to also connect those individuals to what we call our fixed sites, any of our sites for care. 
pharmacy, we've been doing contracted pharmacy with the local pharmacy, but we also received some funding from the county in order to build a pharmacy, an on-site pharmacy that I'm really excited about. And this year, later this year, we should be opening that on-site pharmacy. And the others to care management services, uh, insurance navigator who can connect our uninsured individuals to services, be it the um, ACA program, Affordable Care Act program, or Medicaid expansion now, and community health workers. Similar to um, my colleagues from, from CW Williams, the data that we currently have from our Uniform Data Systems Report is from 2022. And mainly because it's a calendar year report and it closes out at the end of the year. So we just submitted our data to um, HRSA so that we can actually capture our data for 2023. And I have here medical um, patient visits, the number of medical patients, dental patients, and homeless, and also medical, dental, and behavioral health visits that you have. Also, from an ethnicity standpoint, we're, we're very different, and that's the beauty of community health centers. We're not all alike, and some people would say, if you go to one health center, you've seen one health center, right? And so we're different. When Dr. Garman Brown had her vision to start the free clinic back in 2000, she started in East Charlotte, and that area is an area that is very, very diverse. Many of those individuals that started coming to us were Hispanic Latino individuals. And as we moved our location, those individuals stayed with us. So 63% of the population that we serve, even till this day, it's around that number, are Hispanic. Race, African-American, 22%, white, 42%, and other, 34%. I keep talking about when we started as a free clinic. We were very fortunate when we started as a free clinic that many of those individuals going to the free clinic who are uninsured decide to stay. That was a good thing because we were able to provide access to care. But as a community health center, we're responsible for the overhead, salaries, everything. And so it's, you know, that is in an area of our practice that we're really hyper-focused on because we need to be financially sustainable, which is different than a free clinic. And so our uninsured number is very, very high in comparison to other community health centers. And it comes from being a free clinic for all those years. We are focused on drawing in more individuals, Medicaid, Medicare, and also commercial insurance. Medicaid expansion, as you've heard, and we're extremely grateful about that. We partnered with the governor in order to do the kickoff for Medicaid expansion and at the Good Opportunity Campus, but that's gonna happen slowly. And I don't know about my other colleagues, but we're not seeing like a rapid transition. You know, one day, December 1st, it's like, great, Medicaid expansion starts. And then all of a sudden, our uninsured individuals are transitioned over. That is a process that will take time. And then these are just um, some awards that we received from HRSA. And all of the health centers are able to compete for these awards. And it really focuses on our quality and what we're doing as a patient center medical home, PCMH we make sure that our patients are truly the focal point of what we do. Also, um, Mecklenburg County funded programs. Just wanted to give you a quick overview of the funded program because Mecklenburg County is really providing a lot of support to us. Through the American Rescue Plan Act funding that received last year, um, we were able to utilize that fund in order to help us to open a couple of new sites. Um, we opened Express Care Clinic, and the Express Care Clinic is in partnership with Steve Smith and his family foundation. Um, it, they've been a wonderful partner. Steve Smith owns a house on Central Avenue, and it was converted into a clinic, and it was a free clinic for a couple of years. 
when we gained that partnership with them, we really needed to do a lot of renovation within that building in order to provide services to the people in the community. So we spent almost a year just planning and just renovating that space. And we were able to open it up to the community on May, 2023. Um, I would call it express care because it's similar to an urgent care, but not quite. It's same day care. This is to prevent our patients from having to wait weeks and weeks and weeks for an appointment. If I have a cold or my child is sick with a fever, I need someone to see them like right away. And this will afford our community that opportunity. And I would love to take you on a tour when you guys have an opportunity. Dave, Car Dave Cathcart Pediatric Clinic. Um, we opened the Dave Cathcart Pediatric Clinic just the other week. And I want to thank the commissioners, you know, who attended. Thank you so much, you know, Rodriguez and Meyer. Thank you so much for coming out to that opening. This is a partnership. We really believe that we really need to be integrated within the community. Um, we, we just have a, a different vision. We want to be where the people are. And so partnering with Thompson Child and Family, I already shared with you, why we're there. We're there so those individuals who have behavioral health needs, they can access pediatrics, but also the community can access pediatrics. And it's really right behind Greer Heights also in, in a very high need area. Dave Cathcart actually was a longtime board member who served um, when it was a free clinic, our practice, from, and he served at the center for 17 years. And Dave Cathcart had cancer, was still serving on the board just a couple of years ago. And I asked my board chair, I was like, can we name this site after Dave? You know, and he was like, of course. And so we were able to do it. And Dave was right there in the room. And, and he really got really choked up. Um, his family came out from, and he passed away um, probably about six months later. His family came out from California, from all over for the simple open house, we're building satellites. What I mean by that, three exam rooms, a nurse, a doc, a front desk person. It's very simple, but it's a start. So with his family support, you know, um, they helped us to celebrate that. Also, we're partnering, once again, with two other phenomenal organizations, Our Bridge for Kids. They, they have an after-school program here in Mecklenburg County, and they serve immigrants and refugees coming into this community. Also, um, Carolina Migrant Network, they provide legal services. We are co-locating, we will, we will build a family practice clinic on the Aldersgate campus within the administrative building. And the three organizations will come together as what we call like a multi-resource center. So when immigrants, refugees come into the community, we're calling it Charlotte is home. And that's gonna be the name of you know, this site. So once again, it's gonna be in the admin building for Aldersgate. So this is an opportunity for Aldersgate to really reach out into the community because the community changed a lot over the years where Aldersgate is located. That will become our fifth site. So, so as you can tell, we're really expanding and, and really trying to do our part to care for individuals. Um, I already talked about the in-house pharmacy that we'll be building at our Medical Plaza location. Um, and also expansion of dental services was also funded through the ARPA program, looking at ways in which we can help to bring more services in that area. And then I'm very excited about the opioid settlement funding. Um, we were awarded that grant and we're already starting to work in order to set up, you know, that program. Continuation, Ryan White Part A, I talked about that. Um, about the, the physician that we have who started the Ryan White Clinic over at Atrium has joined us. And we also have the second um, HIV provider. Um, and then our dental team also continues to provide comprehensive care for Ryan White patients too. So Ryan White is not only for medical, but it's for dental too. I'm just gonna go through this a little bit quickly so that we have time for the next presenter. Healthcare for the Homeless is another program. I talked about that also. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Allison. I appreciate your, your presentation. 
Uh, the next presenter is Don Holloman from Cabarrus Royan Community Health Clinic. And for all the locations that um, is, are mentioned in the presentations, we'll get the commissioners the addresses um, in one sheet uh, as a follow up. Thank you. Yep. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Alan. All right. Let me get situated up here. See me. Oh. Oh, okay. This is uh... so. We do. We just. I can help you with the technology. <laughs> <laughs> just the cursor. Okay. All right. Well, <clears throat> first and foremost, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Don Holloman. I'm the chief executive officer of Cabarrus Royan Community Health Center. We are a community health center and located in Concord, North Carolina, with uh, 10 locations um, spanning from uh, exit 41 now, which is on Sugar Creek Road, all the way up to East Spencer. And I'll get into a little bit more of that. But first and foremost, let me let me stop and uh, bring you greetings from my board. My board chair, Robert Freeman, wanted to be here today, but he had a prior commitment, so he could not be here. Let me also bring you greetings from my staff, 140 team members strong. My chief administrative officer, Brittany Payne, is over there. And then finally, let me bring you greetings from our patients. Over 17,000 patients and over 55,000 patient encounters. We say thank you for the opportunity to come into Mecklenburg County. We won't let you down, and we are very happy to be here. What I want to do is just kind of give you a brief background of who we are, what makes us, and then talk about the services that we provide through our network. Then I want to tell you about the impact that we make to the community once we once we are integrated into the community, what we benchmark and how we measure our success. Then I want to take you over a brief timeline of what our goal is in Mecklenburg County for the next two to four years. Is that all right? Sounds like a plan. Let's do it. All right. So as I stated before, let me make sure I can drive and do this at the same time. All right. So cursor. All right. There we go. Um, once again, uh, we were founded in 2006 as a federally qualified community health center by some concerned residents in Concord, North Carolina. What actually happened was there was a mill in Concord, in, in Concord, North Carolina that closed down, and there were hundreds of thousands of residents that were going without quality health care. Some concerned residents came together and worked with the county and state to form our community health center, which was established in 2006. One of those founding members is my board chair, Robert Freeman, who's still my board chair today. So we have a lot of experience in who we are and what we do. What I wanted to do is take a brief moment, and uh, Carolyn has done a, such an elegant job on talking about the badges. And um, as federally qualified health centers, we are benchmark. We are benchmark on certain standards across. 93 platforms across 19 chapters. But what I want you to take away is take away is this. There are 1,600 community health centers across the country, representing over 30,000 service sites, representing providing services to over 31 million individuals, okay? Out of those 1,600 community health centers, 10% of them are gold level quality standard health centers. That's 160. Out of those 160, there are four in the state of North Carolina for 2022 to 2023. And in the Charlotte area, there's one, that's us. So we're very, very um, proud of the quality of service that we deliver throughout our 10 locations. Now we're a little bit different because we have freestanding clinics, we have public housing clinics, we have migrant clinics, we have mobile clinics, and we also have homeless clinics. So our goal is to span every touch point of a service delivery access site to be able to ensure that we are expanding access to care. As I stated before, we are we start down in exit 41 on Sugar Creek, uh, Sugar Creek Boulevard, and we go all the way up to uh, East Spencer. We ride that 85 corridor, and we are right off of pretty much every major exit as you go up um, 85. Um, what I want to do is touch a brief. So when you look at our organization, like Carolyn said, we're made up of a really diverse patient population because we span such a wide area. But in 2023, we just completed our UDS report. So in 2023, we saw over 17,000 patients. Our demographics is a little bit like Carolyn's, very diverse. Um, as you see, our demographics from our, our, 
Our white population is 40%. African-American is 22%. Hispanic is almost 38%. One of the great things about our organization, even though we have 140 individuals who are employed by our organization, over 53% of them are bilingual. So we ensure that our service, we ensure that our team members also represent the patients that we serve. 20% of our patient population is a public housing, uh, is, is from a public housing background. 2% is from a homeless population background. And in 2023, we saw 53,000 encounters. Now, what does that mean? From a medical standpoint, we had we saw over roughly about 40,000 uh, medical encounters. But our dental practice is one of the largest dental practices from a public health standpoint that stretches multi uh, multi counties. We saw almost 10,000 dental visits for the year. We saw right about 8,000 behavioral health and psychiatry visits for the year and substance abuse visits for the year. So as an, as an organization, we are consistently growing to move the needle um, in the communities that we serve. Make sure I get this. All right. So as we talk about the services, everybody's done an excellent job in talking about the services that they provide. Our goal is to be as comprehensive as possible in all of the communities that we serve, okay? We offer primary care, dental, behavioral health. We offer uh, imaging services, special population services, and mobile services. But our goal is to craft our services to that individual community. Um, we're one of the few health centers, and just like Carolyn, we opened up our urgent care center um, a year ago at in, in Cabarrus County, and it literally allowed easy access, timely access, same day access, walk in access to our patient population who couldn't get in um, with anywhere else. And we were able to do that for as low as forty five dollars. Um, we are we've opened five dental practices in the last three years. Our behavioral health service department continues to grow. We have six LCSWs, two psychiatric nurse practitioners, and four um, psychiatrists. When we look at our other services, we provide referral coordination, care coordination, medication assistance, health coaching, mobile services, special populations. Again, um, we have two homeless popu home homeless clinics that we operate. One is in uh, one is in Rowan County. I'm sorry because we're about to open another one, Brittany, uh, <laughs> in Concord this summer with the Salvation Army. And our third one is with Shelter Health Services here in Mecklenburg County. Um, we're very excited to say that we just opened mammography services. For the last year, we've been doing mobile mammography um, in uh, Cabarrus and Rowan County. And as of last week, we opened, we broke ground and started our um, own in-house mammography uh, service uh, at our Cabarrus location. And as of last week, we also opened our first uh, retail pharmacy. So um, 2024 has really been a very good year for our organization as we work to meet the needs of the communities that we serve. All right. What I wanted to talk briefly about is how we make an impact and how we focus on uh, the areas that we serve. So our organization, we focus on zip codes. We're, we're huge on data. We're huge on data. Our goal is to target those zip codes that are going with limited access and have barriers to care. What we do is we bring a comprehensive model that focuses on medical, dental, behavioral health, ancillary services, mobile services to that patient population. So over the last five years, our organization has grown tremendously. So from 2006 to 2018, we only operated four locations, okay? Over the last five years, we've grown to 10 locations. We've seen over 220,000 patient visits from our network of clinics. We've touched 80 zip codes in the last five years. And we ensure that every zip code that we go into, we penetrate that market by 10%. We wanna make sure that those low income, uninsured, underserved individuals have an access point to care, okay? When we go in from a quality standpoint, we also focus on reducing, reducing health disparities. We focus on chronic disease management, hypertension, diabetes, like everyone else does. But we also focus on health education and preventative care, which we're really excited to, to, to be a part of. Well, our dental clinic, from a preventative care standpoint, we focus on preventative, restorative, and emergency care. 
we're one of the only organizations that you could come to up up and down the highway and get a crown for $175. You can get an extraction done. You can get a full visit with us that, that's a comprehensive exam, that's an extraction, that's a post, that's a, um, and, and an imaging and, and an x-ray for $75. So we pride ourselves on being able to make um, economical efficient uh, healthcare opportunity um, access points for the residents in our community. So we have a balanced scorecard in our organization. We're very transparent. So I just, um, I'll start off, I should have said that first. <laughs> We're very transparent. We have a balanced scorecard that we benchmark ourselves off of. This balanced scorecard comes from the Healthy, Healthy People 2030 um, guidelines. One of the focal points of that, uh, um, of those guidelines is being patient-centered medical home certified. We're able to say that each one of our locations are patient-centered medical home certified. We really pride ourselves on the ability to ensure that we are improving the quality of care in the communities that we serve. As you look at our balanced scorecard, these are just some of the indicators that we track on a monthly basis. The areas in green are in compliance. Excuse my typo. I got a little too excited when I found out I was going to be presenting here today. Um, and the areas in yellow are the areas that we are this close to closing the gap if we can do a little more. And that's what we focus on each day, getting better, doing a little bit more. As we look at the target zip code, like I said before, we are huge on data. A lot of people ask me, well, how did you get to Mecklenburg County? How did you get to Mecklenburg County? Well, we didn't get to Mecklenburg County, Mecklenburg County came to us. Over the COVID pandemic, we were able to really expand our, our COVID task force and we, we actually provided 30,000 uh, COVID tests, over 5,000 vaccines, but we were one of the only uh, community health centers in the area that had a mobile unit and had multiple PCR rapid testing machines in March of 2020 when COVID first started. So there was a lot of oral health, a lot of dental providers that were closed during that pandemic period of time. We were able to still be open. We did not close one day. We did not go telemedicine this. We still saw our patient population because they were coming in to be seen. But what we were doing is we were screening them with our PCR test to be able to get them to come in within the first 15, well, because it come back, the, the results come back in 15 minutes. We were able to get them right into the dental uh, practice. We seen a huge uptick from uh, residents who've come, who came from Mecklenburg County into Cabarrus County to access our dental services. So as we continue to grow and they found out more about our services, they started accessing medical, they started accessing uh, imaging, they started accessing other related services. So what we do is we looked at certain zip codes and we're saying, saying to ourselves, well, where are we growing at? Where are the, where's this patient population coming from? So as you see uh, 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 zip code 28213, we grew by 82% in the last 12 months. We penetrate that market by 11%. And when I say penetrate that market, what we do is we look at the total patient population, which is about 40,000, 44,000. We look at how many individuals are qualifying under low income or meet the health center standards, which is 17,000. How many patients are actually accessing community health centers and what are we doing and what our patient population is coming out of that and what we need to do to increase that patient population is create access points, bring the services to that patient population, mobile services, special population services. So another large Mecklenburg County that, that uh, zip code that grew for us was 28262. That grew by 57% for us. Once again, same type of demographic. Sorry about the typo at the end. I told you I was a little excited when I got a chance to get up here and do a presentation. But when you look at our target zip codes that we go into, we're going into zip codes that we already have a catchment area, that we already have a target population. And we're looking to provide those services to that, to that patient population to access so they can cut their drive down coming to Cabarrus County. Um, once again, we are thankful for the funding opportunity from Mecklenburg County. Um, and we do not take it lightly. Um, we hit the ground running. Within the first six months of uh, Ben introducing himself to us <laughs> um, in July um, and signing the agreement with Mecklenburg County, the next month we had our second mobile unit. We had a mobile, we had our oral health mobile unit on site, ready to go. We started uh, looking for our location, which is now at 721 West Sugar Creek Road. Um, 
Over the last six months, we've onboarded an additional 11 individuals specifically for Mecklenburg County projects. And at the time of this presentation, we were in uplift. Now we have completed our Sugar Creek uh, location and it is up and running with all service, all services being rendered, which is medical, dental and behavioral health services. Um, what I wanna do and just kind of give you a snapshot, we, we, we champion who we are, we champion our team members and we champion the patients that we serve. Um, some of the pictures that you're gonna see of all the pictures that you're gonna see are of, us, of our staff. Who's delivering care in Mecklenburg County to the residents um, that are accessing the services. So from a shelter health standpoint, we have a partnership with shelter health for the last two and a half years where we were going to shelter health on once a week out of our pocket because they needed assistance from somebody who had a mobile unit uh, uh, program. So with this funding, it allows us to move our one day a week to three days a week. Um, my chief administrative officer, Brittany Payne, is over the mobile program. And now we operate it three days a week. And we also operate it where we're bringing dental and behavioral health services to the shelter health population. What we were seeing, we were dealing with an issue. Um, and that's why the Mecklenburg County funding is so timely and is so important to us is because when we were down in 2021, when we had, our, had those clients exiting the program, they were looking for us. We were ending up busing and transporting patients by cab via taxi to our McGill location for dental services because they wanted to continue with their treatment plans and they wanted to continue with the medical plans that we had established for them. Um, the pictures that you see are both of the mobile units that we operate. One is uh, of our, our, our physician assistant, Candace Locklear, who operates, who is the primary provider on uh, the mobile unit, and Dr. Gonzalez, who is our dentist on the mobile unit as well. Um, like I said, we're very transparent. These are um, the uh, benchmarks that we have uh, agreed to, with, to um, ensure that we can work to meet as an organization. One of the things that we do is we look at data, we benchmark ourselves off of uh, where we need to be, and we work to get there. Um, we just started this program, like I said, um, with Mecklenburg County as of July. We increased our services with Shelter Health Services as of November, and you can see where we're trending as it relates to the um, ensuring compliance um, as an organization with that project. Um, well, like I said, I, I would have took a whole new slide of pictures if we would have since we're open now, but now you're seeing our Mecklenburg, our, our Sugar Creek Health Center, which we are very excited to launch. Um, the pictures that you're seeing right now is when we were going through uplift. We have a 10,000 square foot building on 721 West Sugar Creek Road. Um, and we've, we've, we officially opened that location as of uh, February 5th. Very excited. Our, our operating hours are eight to five. We have one day that we will be operating a little bit earlier. Um, other people have asked me, like, when are we going to get into extended hours? Well, we said, first, we got to open, then we can assess, and then we can adjust as need be. Um, but we're really excited about this clinic right now. It's open, um, and it's averaging anywhere between 20 to 23 patients a day um, in its second week um, of, of uh, services being open. So the word is getting out there. Um, what you're seeing right now is the benchmarks that we associated with the uh, Mecklenburg County uh, with our Sugar Creek Health Clinic. Um, the numbers are a little bit lower because like I said, we just opened. But what we did uh, before then is we took our mobile unit um, and every Wednesday uh, from November and December and January, we parked our mobile unit in that parking lot and started seeing patients to be able to introduce ourselves to the community. In addition, we also hosted a health fair um, in the community on December 2nd that was, that was attended very nicely by a lot of the residents to introduce ourselves as well um, to the community. Um, what you're seeing now is the services that we provide at uh, Sugar Creek and our providers. Um, Dr. Amber Harper, who's my assistant uh, medical director, is uh, one of the providers there with Olivia Ford, our um, physician assistant. You also see Dr. Gonzalez, who is our dentist there. I'm also happy to say um, by us being able to come into um, Mecklenburg County, we have just hired a, a, a doctor. Um, medical doctor, Dr. Anitra Bailey, will be our full-time provider starting in late March, early April um, at our Sugar Creek Clinic as well. So we're bringing all the services full full circle for this um, uh, needed access point. 
And from a behavioral health standpoint, Dr. Jamie Stevenson, he quarterbacks our substance abuse, mental health, psychiatry, and our MAT related programs. Um, we operate um, full service as it relates to counseling and treatment. And just like uh, Carolyn has also said, we're very, we're big, very big on warm handoffs. There's a lot of times you have a provider in the room with a patient and they notice a social determinant of health, they notice something is not right, they have the ability to step out, grab that LCSW, let that LCSW walk in there, and we can really curtail a lot of things before they happen. So we're really excited about that. Um, the next two to four years, as we come into a community, we, we look to assess to see what the needs are of that community. One of the one of the things that we are looking to accomplish with our Sugar Creek um, Health Center over the next two to four years is to increase our access and substance abuse, to increase our HIV um, access and infectious disease within the next year. We're looking to expand, you know, as additional opportunities come available. We want to bring urgent care services down here. We want to expand our dental clinic. We want to we want to expand our imaging center as well to include mammography uh, services as well. We're going to be looking to partner with schools, just like everybody else, to be able to bring the services to those kids to ensure that that allows them to be able to receive the services that they need, where they can also stay in school. We're going to be looking at increasing our touch points and special populations. Homeless health care is one of the uh, is one of the ethos of our board. So we look at places where we can affect change. And we have already started talking to a few individuals who represent homeless programs in Mecklenburg County, where we're gonna be looking at increasing those access points through mobile care or through stand-up clinics as well. And then additional data. We take the data, we look at the data, we look at where we need to increase access points. Like I said before, in the last five years, we've increased our access points by six and we're not done. And we're, we're gonna consistently look to um, see where the community need is to be able to uh, meet that. And then finally, like I said, we have a 10,000 square foot uh, building uh, on Sugar Creek Road. So we're gonna be looking at ways to expand that, to make that a community resource center, to make that, to expand that for dental services as well. And also at a pharmacy. Like I said, we just, we just opened the pharmacy two weeks ago. So we'll be looking at hopefully being able to do the same thing here in Mecklenburg County within the next 24, uh, well, two to four years. Um, and like I said before, we are, Thoroughly excited about this opportunity to be able to expand access in Northeast Mecklenburg County. Um, the residents of the of the shelter health uh, of shelter health services and North Mecklenburg they're, they're going to start they're really going to benefit from the array of services that we offer. But like I said, our services are comprehensive. So once we walk you in the door for one thing, we want to get you to we want you to be seen in all other type of services as well. So on behalf of the board management staff of Cabarrus Moran Community Health Centers. Thank you for this opportunity. I think I needed some water because I'm got, I got a little raspy now, but I'll be ha more than happy to answer any questions and I hope I didn't go too fast or or um, talk too raspy without water. Thank well, thank, thank you. Yeah, yeah Reynard is gonna give a one minute summation <laughs> so that the board will have an opportunity um, to ask questions of all uh, pre presenters. I'll just quickly say thank you to all the presenters for preparing. And I do want to acknowledge Dr. Bonnie Coyle and Ben Chambers who manage this work for the health department. Um, and I do want to also just note for context that these three FQHCs are part of a network of partners that we work with to expand access to primary care. They do not reflect the entire network, um, but we are very proud of the work that they do to be able to provide medical homes for people specifically who uh, need a place to get not just physical health care, but also behavioral and dental care all in one spot. So uh, thanks to them for that and look forward to any questions. We can, I can chime in on those as, as necessary. Well, we, we got about 22 minutes. So uh, let me try to go to my colleagues. So I, I want to ask all the presenters to go up front um, while the board, um, to give the board an opportunity to ask you questions. And when they ask questions, if you can go to the mic, um, because we are recording this session. Can, can we kind of uh, focus on one of the providers and kind of go down one of the providers at a time? Would that, would that work with everyone or what? Um, you know, you're kind of over the place. Kind of over the place. All right, let's let's try <laughs> and see. My best. Let's see where we go. Give we'll, me time on that. Three minutes. We'll see what okay. we get. All right, Commissioner Meyer. Thank then you, Commissioner Leak. And then, if our uh, guest commissioner has a question, go to her. All right. Commissioner Meyer. Okay, thank you so much. First of all, thank you for what each of you are doing for the community. It really is amazing. Um, it does not go unnoticed. 
I will say I, I didn't know much about the Roran one. And so I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for that. Um, probably what came across from, by the time you spoke, I'm curious, are you, you know, it seems to me we're covering a lot of area mm -hmm. and are you in competition with each other? Do you benefit each other? Do you, how does that work among the, these three organizations? Let me, yeah, I'll take that question. That's a very good question because HRSA, our major funder, really encourages us to partner. Uh, and recently I've reached out to both of my colleagues, you know, for a letter of support so that we can change what's called our scope so that we can utilize the hospital modal, mobile vehicles. They both turned around those letters of support within like a day. And so that's the way in which we can help to partner. Um, also our state association, um, I am the vice chair for our state association of community health centers. We are looking at and really started to regionalize between among all the different areas throughout North Carolina. And so our health centers are within the same region. And we're gonna be looking at ways in which we could further partner because you're right, we shouldn't be tripping over each other because the community really needs the services that all of us can provide. If Commissioner Mar, if I could also add to that. In theory though, um, there there's enough need to go around. You know, Mecklenburg County overall does not have an adequate supply of federally qualified health centers, I would argue. Uh, and so if you think about the fact that we have more than 100,000 residents who don't have health care insurance, which means that they likely cannot afford care unless they have to pay cash or pay a sliding scale fee, our network of providers, including the three of them, plus the other free and low cost clinics don't have capacity to serve more than 50,000 residents. So we've got a huge gap still. So in terms of competitive, it's not there. There really is more need than we have supply of services. Then you answered my next question, because I mean, there's so much need and I was going to ask you about the need. So my my I, I'll stop at my third question. Um, what is my third question? Um, what the so we they're federally qualified health centers. We've got public health. What are there other ones that we're not talking about that we actually have so many questions, but are there other ones that don't have that are not federally qualified that Absolutely. they're private? Like, yeah. can you name some? What are some examples? Yeah. Sure. So, so Camino's Health Center is not an FQHC. Um, Project Hope or uh, six part. 529 is not a FQHC, Matthews Free Clinic, Lake Norman Community Health, they're not designated. StarMed, is that one? StarMed, the Blessing Foundation does not have an FQHC designation. What happens is uh, if you become an FQHC, the federal government gives you a grant. And I believe each of you all have a single access point. Does yes. anybody have an extra one? When you say a single access point, what are you referring You just to? get one grant. We, well, yeah. we, we, rece we receive the, we don't just get one grant, but the one grant that you're referring to is a section 330 grant. That's the base so you're grant. absolutely right, yep. which qualifies us as a community health center. Yep. As a federally qualified community health center, we undergo certain standards, rigorous standards, and are obligated to meet those standards and guidelines from the federal government. Uh, we actually receive 330E grant funding. We also receive other grant funding through the throughout the federal government and the different programs. Uh, right now, we probably, God knows, you probably have many more than we do, but we have about seven uh, different federal grants, and uh, we're obligated to each entity mm -hmm. to meet the standards and the guidelines and accreditation. Mm -hmm. So um, Don was the only one that spoke to accreditation pretty well. Uh, thank you, Don, yep. because meeting that PCMH or NCQA is very important. Uh, and we that means the standard by which we have to follow and the rigor that we have to go through on an annual basis to satisfy that accreditation. So, Deborah, let me just clarify. I think the commissioner is asking a slightly different question. They they receive one grant for being an FQHC. They have sub grants that make their, they become eligible for if they have the designation. In some communities, a single organization will have multiple base grants for different service areas within the community. For example, you might have one entity that has three coverage areas that they get a full base grant, which I think is $750,000. 
Yep. Uh, and so they all only receive one because of the way that their grants are set up. In other communities, you would have more than three access points that have been designated for a county. And in fact, the Roar and Cabarrus is not really one. So we really only have two of the base grants here in Mecklenburg, and you would find more than that in, in other cities of this size. Okay. I'm out all of right, time. Your, your time's out. out of time. Commissioner Leak. Commissioner Leak. Let me first say thank you for the presentation this afternoon. Uh, I didn't know that the Barris and Long County was helping us in Mecklenburg County, Sugar Creek. Uh, my question deals with the taxing of the citizens to meet the funds that you need to operate in Mecklenburg County. How do you address that process? Oh, sure. Um in any situation, uh, we don't, we're not fully reliant upon one funding source. So as we talked about previously, even with our federal base grant, our federal base grant is depends on per location, per programs that you get. Um, then we are expected to be able to maximize our third party payers. Um, we have to be good stewards of Medicaid, Medicare, and those private insurance payers. Then we have additional contracts with the health department, local localities, and things of that nature to be able to offset that cost, to be able to deliver care. So we are not taxing one, or we're not relying upon one funding source. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I was not aware that one county could cross the line and come in and provide help. Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm saying I was not aware of that. Mm -hmm. Glad to know that. I'm not sure the general public is aware of that. But I look at C.W. Williams, who's been a base in Mecklenburg County mm -hmm. for years. I remember when it was founded and by whom it was founded. I knew the doctor and his family. But to see now that we have at least three agencies, meaning C.W. Williams and the uh, other program founded by Dr. Brown, who was an excellent representative in this community and for Barris, Roaring County to come in to cross Mecklenburg line to help us with our problems of health. I'm not sure we're aware of that. How do we get this information across the state and across this community to know that there are they're not boundaries there to stop you from crossing the line? Look. Dr. Sure. So uh, our, our team members work very closely with the association of all the free clinics and low cost clinics, MedLink, to make sure that there is a, cent a central repository of all places that people can go to access care that is not um, that's subsidized in some way. And so they have a master list of locations. And what we've shared it with you guys previously. I'm happy to share it with you. Get back with you so you can clarify that to me. My last question deals with women versus men. Mm -hmm. I keep hearing us talk about the services that we provide for women, how do we reach black men to come in to these agencies for care? Well, that's always a, always been a struggle. I, I have to tell you, uh, one of my particular focus beside HIV has always been with men. If you want to heal the family, you also have to heal the men of the family. That's the only way to survive. We periodically have uh, uh, screenings just for men. We go out, we reach out, we market to men. At one point at C.W. Williams, we had a majority of male providers, in fact. It was, it was really overwhelming. It was like six men to one woman. And as a result, you saw more men coming in. Men are safe with men, just as women are safer with women. Uh, we have to make sure we have a balance in place at the sites. So, as for, I'm sorry. Oh, so from from our standpoint, uh, we thirty five percent of our patient population is male, so we we do have a, a a large male contingency. But our our model of care is 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 if if mom comes in, we our our care coordination team, our front desk staff, our side desk coordinators take our model and we make sure we get the entire patient population to come in. Now, as a man myself, we don't we we go when we're sick. We go. If I can't make it to work, I, I need to have that doctor's note. Let me, let me, let me go. So, or no, no, she forces me to go. Forces me to go. So, what we do is we started, we started crafting services that we knew that cross gender lines. One was urgent care. Uh, I'm, we're, we're men. We're impatient. 
So we want to be able to get in and get out. We had to expand dental services. We had to be able to have male mental health and psychiatry related providers to be able to have those conversations with men across any type of ethnicity so they felt a comfortable place to be able to share. So as a community health center, what we do across the board is we work to meet the needs of the community. Every community is different. They have a different need, but we our goal was to be different each way to meet that need. All right, let me go to Regis McDowell. Uh... Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. Uh, I just have two questions. One is, um, do you guys use um, like a mixture model at all as far as um, serving patients that are paying, you know, uh, are using using insurance not just the underinsured folks. Is yes. that part of your plan? Okay. Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, we're really focused on what's called hair mix. And so we're always looking at the percentage of uninsured to Medicaid, Medicare, and also private insurance. Oh, okay, great. So, so that is, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that that is something that we're always looking at. The other reason why we're paying very close attention to that is because as a community health center, we get reimbursed at a much higher rate for seeing individuals who are Medicaid mm -hmm. and Medicare. And that's why we're a safety net organization. So we want individuals on Medicaid. We want individuals on Medicare. Some of your private practices just can't handle it because the reimbursement is so low. I see. And, okay. it's, a, and it's an arduous process mm -hmm. and uh, they're not accustomed to it. I also want you to know that we also utilize the UDS mapper, which is a national mapper that designates and shows us in every community how many uninsured we have versus insured patients. So we target specifically to those areas. Okay. And, and if you go back into my presentation, two of the slides are from the UDS mapper. So what we're talking about zip code penetration, we're talking about looking at those underserved, those low income, who's accessing uh, free and reduce, who's accessing um, community health centers or free clinics. We're looking at that data to, un to be able to stratify where our patient population is coming from so we can allocate the resources that we have accordingly, because we're all nonprofits up here. We are all balancing a payer mix and trying to ensure that we meet the mission of our organization while expanding access to care with doing more with less. You know, And, and we have to be focused on, hyper-focused on the income of that community. Correct. So for example, we serve one of the poorest communities in the United States, 28208. In that 28208, we cannot charge a higher Correct. standard of care or a higher fee for our slide fee. So we, you know, we slowly increased from $25 to $35 over the last nine years. But, you know, really the market is way up, but mm -hmm. we look at our econ economic status of our uh, zip codes and say they can't afford it. So we keep it there for now. Uh, when that income starts to change in the community, then we project upwards. But our slide fee, fee visit is $35, and for dental services, it's $50. And, and if I may piggyback on what Ms. Weeks said, um, that that's pretty much ex exactly what we are. We receive federal funds to be able to receive, to be able to provide services to any patient, regardless of their ability to pay. Okay. Short so, answers, okay. short questions. Okay, yeah, that, that was my short question. My 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 other <laughs> my real question was, um, I think it's 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 really for um, Dr. Washington. Um, as far as what is the capacity that we should that you know a 1.1 million people county like where should we be like you said we it's don't a hard have question it, there's no standard because it's difficult because we have uh, such a wide mix of organizations that deliver care and we have more than enough supply if you count the private pay institutions or institutions that that could accept Medicare and Medicaid uh, in terms of the provider supply in the community so I don't have a a, a north star in terms of how many fqhcs i have i think some of the things that they're pointing out is once you become an fqhc the federal government gives you a grant that grant is not enough to cover the cost of the operation though it's not nearly enough to cover the cost mm -hmm. of operations so they have to have other sources of revenue that includes patients who can pay 
Uh, it includes the grants that we give them. It also includes our grants that they receive from both of our health systems and other organizations. Uh, they also get the enhanced reimbursements as uh, Ms. Weeks has already mentioned, but they also get access to 340B. So they get their drugs for cheaper mm -hmm. like we do as a health department agency. So there are a lot of incentives that come along with it that our free and low cost clinics who don't have the FQAC designation right. and don't get the grant they don't get any of that, right? So they're operating basically on all basically charity care, essentially, as they're offering that free care to the community members. So having more of these helps create more of a balance in the community in terms of having, um, not having to rely so much on philanthropy, government, and other folks to fund the free and low cost clinics. Uh, but we are at the mercy of the feds in terms of how many of these we can have because they create opportunities for us to create new ones. Uh, and it's not enough just to keep expanding these three with only with they're adding new sites, but not new access points that give them new grants that give them more money at the base. It's just a new place they have to operate, which is basically adding new cost. So we're we are we are subsidizing that as, as a county organization and are proud to do that. Uh, but we do have to in the long term think about, you know, how do we get more of these in the community? My quick question, quick answer. Uh, do I, I, I totally know community health, um, Charlotte Community Health, so you're off the hook. Um, ARPA funds, when you talk about your um, Mecklenburg County and your federal funds, is that any of that ARPA? Have you received ARPA funds? And I'm we sorry did. If I don't know. No, that's fine. Um, all, all health centers back in 2021 received ARPA funds. Um, per the sunset uh, of it, it was extended up until, I think, 1231 of, this, of, of 2023. So we did get ARPA funds. Every health center got some sort of ARPA funds. So what they did with them met that community need, but they all have been expensed. Those were one-time funding. Right. So that's one of the things real quick in 15 seconds, the federal government is great at giving us funding, but a lot of times it's for one time. We'll get you started. Good luck. Okay. So it, it's it's kind of that, that's where our different partnerships come in. Um, and that's why those additional base grant fundings and new access point fundings that are residual fundings that come in every year are so paramount to ensure the success of an organization. But we have to be good stewards of the finances that we get to be able to have a balanced payer mix to ensure that we're maximizing third party and all of our partnerships to expand the care in the community that it needs. We leverage those dollars to go across to the uninsured, but I wanted to make something clear. Thank you, Don, for bringing that up. We do not have ongoing federal access. It is one-time funding often when those funds are available. As you may or may not know, every year that we have an election, it changes our, our ability to uh, receive those federal funds mm -hmm. and how much we get when we get it. We went uh, at one year, we went month to month funding until they had decided what the fiscal uh, uh, what the fiscal contribution was going to be to the FQHCs across America. We also, as CW Williams, we don't receive funding from any hospital system here in Mecklenburg. So I don't want that myth to go forward. We do not receive funding uh, from the uh, hospital systems here. It'd be great if they did because over across all of the FQHCs in the United States, we say what, $400 billion in emergency right. room visits? Mm -hmm. So that's a huge saving across America. And I think more specifically, more specifically like 26 million here in Mecklenburg yeah. County. So that's, that's a huge savings. And some of that would come back to us. We can do more penetration, more work, more services, across um, and save lives because that's essentially what we do. Correct. We save lives, we prevent hospitalization and emergency unit wasted costs. That's correct. Thank you. All right, okay. Commissioner Lee, quick question, quick answer. I remember talking to one of you about your rent. Say you're a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. A lady said to me, you were in uh, Greensboro to a meeting. She was paying $4,000 a month for rent. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. to me was exorbitant an agency that's serving the general public. Mm -hmm. I think it's the young lady on the end. Mm -hmm. Yes. So is it, has it gone up since we talked? No, no, it hasn't. It, it, it hasn't. So you well, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I yeah, spend yeah, much, yeah. More than that. much more than that. Much more than that. Let me get some of that. Let me get some of that. We take that one. Ahead, but ahead, it, ahead. it's really expensive. Think, Hold up. Because you say you're not, you say you're nonprofit, mm -hmm. but then when you are seeking those funds, to advocate for the general public and especially in district two that you're spending more for rent than you are to service the actual people you're sitting there to work with. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you brought How that up. How do we help you 
to change that. So I think I talked to the Commissioner Griffin about this. In fact, um, one of the points is usually in most counties, and I've been, this is my fourth county uh, over across America from New York to Florida to Maine to here, or New York to Maine to Florida to here. And I have to tell you, this is the only county I've ever been in whereby we don't have that relationship with the hospital system or the county or the city in order to give us the buildings, do that $1 exchange, and we renovate the, the housing. This way, we save those costs. This is the only county that that has not happened. Um, I don't know if it's happened for you recently, but it's never happened for C.W. Williams. So I, I know, uh, like, like Deborah, I've been I, I've been doing this for about twenty five years, and I've been in ten different states. And uh, coming out of Tennessee was my most recent state as a CFO, COO. Um, we we did have more of a relationship, but this relationship here is paramount because the relationship with the county and the city allows us to open doors into the hospital and have those conversations. I'm used to paying ten thousand dollars in rent, um, but I'm also used to paying a dollar. Right. So it's 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 whatever that community needs. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to be, once again, good stewards of the money that we get. And we have to make sure that we're delivering on what we said we were going to do for the county and the city to ensure that you still believe in us enough to continue to give us the funding to increase the access to care. Because being on the Hill last week in, in D.C. and we were advocating for um, community health centers, one of the things is we haven't had a base grant adjustment or a pay raise in 10 years. In 10 years, but we're still expected to see more and more patients. So when, as I was talking to the assistant uh, deputy director and I was telling him about our relationship that we have in Mecklenburg County with the county health department, he was like with, with the county with the county. He said, this is what we envision. We don't want you to be fully relying upon us. We need the community to step up to support you to be able to increase access to care. And the model that you guys are building in Charlotte is something that we want to see across the country. All right. I Really appreciate. I knew this would be a lively discussion. <laughs> uh, Health care is so critically important for all of us. And I'm just excited the fact that we had an opportunity to have you all in here. Each of the uh, presenters has invited us to come out and visit their, their sites. So this shouldn't be the end of the conversation, the relationship with these three providers, but just the beginning of this relationship mm -hmm. and certainly go out. Uh, I have certainly a whole lot of questions, but uh, I'll just sort of sum it up real real quickly. Uh, 18,000, I was 13,000 for C.W. Williams, 5,000 for Charlotte uh, Center, 17,000, but most of those are Cabarrus County. But there are 353,000 uh, folk uh, registered for Medicaid in Mecklenburg County, and that will go up because of, of Medicaid expansion. Doesn't even include uh, Medicare. So to answer Dr. Washington's position, you know, are we crossing, stepping on each other? There's a huge gap out there that needs to be serviced. And, and Commissioner Leak raised an interesting point about rent. As we have first refusal for school sites in Mecklenburg County, maybe we could take on one of these school sites and offer it for exactly. a dollar for you guys to expand. So that would be awesome. Yeah, that, would be awesome. That, would be awesome. that would be awesome. That would be awesome. That, uh, Commissioner Leak raised uh, the kinds of questions and answers I think are appropriate mm -hmm. for these kinds of discussions as we get ideas during the funding cycle and all through the year. What can we do to improve access to health care? And that's certainly just one example that, that uh, was was presented. So I want to I want to thank uh, all of you for your presentation. We still have to have uh, an action item at the end of this because we didn't have enough folks. So let, we need to close that piece out. Uh, you know, Ms. Weeks? I just want to make one mention, um, and I don't think any of us referred to this, but throughout the COVID environment, it changed a lot of dynamics, but particularly the cost for service. So hiring someone at $45,000 now costs us $60,000. And it's impossible to meet those increased expenses with the monies that we received during COVID that allowed us to pay for those services yeah. are now gone. That's right. But we still have to hire those same people for fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 more, and that's not doctors. The doctors are thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 more. So I just want you to also consider this would be helpful uh, to help reinvest in the hiring of qualified staff. 
Well, there's no shortage of needs in Mecklenburg County uh, as the chair of the Health and Human Services uh, Committee. We certainly hear that uh, from many quarters, but certainly health is so important. And the position that Dr. Leak uh, asked about rent was something I hadn't really thought of, but as the Board of County Commission has to uh, refuse or accept uh, schools that are that are closing down. I'll certainly keep that in mind as we work. Uh, Deputy County Manager, um, uh, Trotman, do you have anything to say before we come back into voting on our minutes? So we have to close that out. Yes, sir. Um, um, as stated earlier, we'll get the addresses and we'll map uh, those addresses for you to see where they're located. Um, because they mentioned several different locations. We'll also provide you with the budgets for that we provide for each of these organizations, um, one general fund and, and two, the ARPA funds, um, because it's it's significant. Um, we will also, I think Commissioner Link, you ask about Cabarrus, Ruin, and how is one government coming over, over the border? Well, they're a nonprofit. They're not Actually, they just have the name of Cabarrus Royan. They're not associated with Cabarrus Royan County. Yes, um, and that's, that's and that, that relationship was initially established with some of the board members. And then we included them in our budget this past year. So that's that's how we established the relationship there. So we definitely look for. Are you saying our board? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, I, I went up to Cabarrus and toured their facility, uh, talked to the chairman of their board. Um, they received uh, patients. I also went down to Amity and Rock Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, they received patients from Mecklenburg County, even in Rock Hill. So health care is really important to me as an individual. So I've been kind of going all around the region, trying to figure out uh, how to uh, expand health care, but more particularly the impact in terms of reduction of new newly diagnosed HIV, the reduction of some of the chronic illnesses, uh, all those things. So uh, we'll we'll get some of these folks to come back and and talk, maybe drill down. But right now we're at two thirty two thirty six, and uh, we're going to have to close out and and do our minutes so and move. then close the minutes. So, uh, okay, <laughs> a motion with respect to approval of our minutes or our last meeting has been made and has been seconded. All those in favor indicate say by aye. Uh -huh. Oppose the same sign. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. We're at the end of our meeting. Uh, is there a motion that we adjourn? So moved. All right, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed? Meetings adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. I went down on Saturday to the that street off of Ladies School. What's that lady? What's that street? No, no, not on Ladies Ford, but on it's off of Ladies Ford. What's that lady? Yeah, what's that street? Yeah, yeah. No, it's not Kelly Avenue anymore. Oh, they changed the name, didn't they? Yeah, but it, that's something they else. It. No, it, it's Rudine's on the corner. Okay. Well, it, it used to be Kelly Avenue, but I think they changed it to Dr. Brown. Yeah. But I knew it was Kelly Avenue. Our yeah. church was Kelly Avenue when it crossed Baden's Ford. What church? University Park. Oh, okay. So okay. that that is Keller Avenue. You know, but the name is not there. Yeah, it must have been. Uh, it's Dr. the latest Dr. name. Oh, you talking about the Tommy Campbell Center? Yeah, that's not there. Yeah, that that's straight up. Yeah, that's straight up. Yeah. No, it goes all the way down. Well, it goes all the way down, but um, Captain Simmons, I know Captain Simmons. I thought it was in Captain Simmons. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's when the people get shot at and stuff like that. It's terrible, and the city's doing nothing about it. Yeah. Yeah, they have to pop and start doing nothing. Thank you so much. I have oh, no. fun. I, I know. Oh, I know you're trying to. Yeah, but she. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, but she, she answered a, she answered a good question. We have a few schools 
uh, when they want to sell them. And do something like that. Uh, I asked them at what time you do this because I asked people talk about, about how many that were there. There was a lot of vacancies. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. so, yeah. so yeah. that yeah. that yeah. weekend that weekend we, that we can raise that we can raise that we can raise. Yes. Okay. 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 Okay.